Council for the Welfare of Immigrants. Um, Lucy is appearing in person and has just arrived, uh, with Zoe appearing virtually. Before calling the first member to ask a question, I should like to remind all members that questions should be limited to matters within the scope of the Bill and that we must stick to the timings in the programme motion uh, the committee has agreed. Uh, for this session, we have until 2.30. 2.45, right, OK, uh, until 2.45. Uh, could the witnesses please introduce themselves? Shall we start with Lucy? Good afternoon, members. My name is Lucy Morton. I'm the professional officer of the ISU, which is the union that represents Borders, Immigration and Customs staff. And to you, Zoe? Good afternoon. Um, my name is Zoe Gardner. I'm actually Policy and Advocacy Manager at the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants, so I think my title was... Um, communicated wrongly before. Um, but uh, JCWI is one of the oldest organisations in the country representing um, migrants and refugees going through the UK immigration system. Okay, thank you both. And can I call the first member who'd like to ask a question? Uh, Bambos. Um, thank you, Mr. McConnell. Uh, so my first question uh, to both uh, Lucy and Zoe is that the premise of the bill, uh, according to the government, is to fix the broken asylum system. In your opinion, does this bill fix the broken asylum system? And if not, what needs to happen to fix the system? I think if we knew how to fix the system, um, we'd probably all have much quieter and uh, easier lives. Um, the bill addresses some of the issues with the current asylum system, um, but without a significant underpinning of resources, it is not going to make uh, the difference that, that is anticipated. We've reached the situation that we have with the structures uh, both above and below the border uh, breaking, if not in fact broken, uh, because of under-resourcing. So you, know, you can set up, a, for example, an additional uh, fast-track appeal process, but if you don't resource the courts in order to enable them to have the rooms to hold the hearings, the judges to, to make those adjudications, the, the clerks to, to promulgate it, then it makes no difference. You can make arrangements uh, in, or express wishes in a bill to return um, migrants to a safe third country or to process them offshore or to turn them back before they reach UK waters. All of this requires the cooperation of international partners and if you can't achieve that, then it's nothing more than words on a bit of paper. And Zoe, do you have a response to that? Yes, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, the short answer is that the available evidence does not support the approach that is taken in this bill. Um, the aims of the bill that the government have put forward are to create a fairer asylum system um, and to discourage the use of irregular journeys by asylum seekers using smuggling routes. Um, a fair asylum system would provide protection to refugees based on their need. Um, this bill does not propose a system that would do that. Um, furthermore, the evidence that is available from previous similar policies that have been enacted in other countries or that have previously been enacted in the UK show us that this approach is unlikely to deter people from seeking to come to the UK using um, irregular means because it doesn't provide meaningful alternative ways for people to travel. Um, in short, this bill won't work. Um, the only people who will be celebrating its implementation would be those criminal smuggling gangs. McDonald. Oh, did you have a oh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, sorry? Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I was going to ask a question um, to Lucy first, just on the issue of resourcing. Um, there was a recent report that, uh, it's, that there are 399 cases that are in the system that have taken 10 years and have still not been processed. That's asylum claims. Uh, is that more than just a, a resourcing issue? The, I don't know the details of those 399. It is likely, if they've been in the system for more than 10 years, and about 10 years ago I was an asylum case working, the decision maker, um, there will be other elements within that uh, that are more complex. 
it is possible to repeatedly delay conclusion of a case uh, by the late submission of evidence, for example. Whether that's the case in any all or some uh, of that group, I don't know. But clearly, the needs of anyone genuinely seeking protection in the UK are not served by being stuck in a system, uh, not, not for months, let alone for years. Uh, just one more question for me. Um, the Clause 10 of the bill, it um, treats people differently based on how they arrive. So if you arrive uh, via a regular route, you are given less protection. Um, in your opinion, both you, Lucy, and Zoe, do you think this uh, achieves the aims of the bill? My understanding is the stated aim is to deter irregular migration. I cannot see how some uh, theoretical change, which is what it is at the moment at least, uh, to how you might eventually be treated when you are finally granted asylum here, whether that would deter irregular migration. And one of the elements proposed for the group to refugees, the ones who have entered irregularly, is that it may limit their family reunion rights. Uh, absolutely accepting the political balancing act that has to be done here. If you prevent people from travelling through a regular route, they will use an irregular route. So that alone seems to be circuitous. Uh, and Zoe? Um, I agree with the assessment that we've just heard. Um, the available evidence shows that people who are um, making these journeys in order to seek asylum don't know the detail of different refugee protection regimes in different countries. They base their decision making on where to, where to go. Um, either they don't make the decision at all themselves and it's in the hands of the smugglers who transport them, or else they make the decision based on their connection to a country, having family members in a country, speaking the language, having other connections, potentially um, ex-colleagues in the case of Afghans um, at the current time who may have worked with British military um, in Afghanistan, that might be a reason for them trying to come to the UK. So the details of the system um, aren't going to deter anybody. And in terms of the aim of the bill, which is uh, concerned with fairness, if we look at how the um, inadmissibility rules have been operating so far, in the first uh, six months of their operation since January, four and a half, four and a half thousand people have been issued with a notice of intent um, under the inadmissibility rules. Um, 173 of those people are from Afghanistan. Um, this means that, in effect, their asylum claim has been put on hold for six months, um, at least, while the government seeks to find another place to send them to anywhere else um, but here. Um, this is obviously not in the interest of fairness when it comes to people from Afghanistan who are very clearly fleeing a dangerous situation. Um, JCWI has a client from Syria. He's 19 years old. He was individually um, targeted by the Syrian military um, and was forced to flee uh, at a moment's notice, had no other option but to take uh, an irregular route. And he has two sisters living here in the UK. Um, so that was what motivated his choice to, to pay a smuggler to make a desperate escape and to come to the UK. He is now in these inadmissibility process, his mental health deteriorating because of his fear that he will be sent away. The government has told him that they're considering his removal to Austria or to France or to anywhere else, um, anywhere else being somewhere that has no legal obligation to take him in um, and where he will have no family members. So if he were to be removed, we would potentially simply be giving the smuggling gangs a repeat customer because he would obviously have reason to wish to seek to come back to the UK. But also, it doesn't make any sense to pause his claim and that of four and a half thousand others um, for the time being, probably more at this stage, um, and have them waiting in this limbo system at great cost to the taxpayer, at great harm to their mental health, um, on the basis of agreements to return people here, there or anywhere that we don't actually have yet. Um, this whole approach is not going to achieve its aims whatsoever. The only thing it will achieve is cruelty, delays, additional bureaucracy, and as I say, lining the pockets of the smuggling gangs. Thank you, so uh, I'll let other people ask questions. If this time, I would like to ask questions at the end, if there is time. Uh, Stuart MacDonald. Thank you, Mr MacDonald. Uh, can I start uh, with Zoe Gardner, please? Thank you for your evidence so far. Um, earlier, we heard from John Featonby of Red Cross uh, that there was only one clause 
uh, in this bill that would directly impact on smugglers themselves by increasing possible sentences. Um, but you've gone a little bit further and said, actually, on the whole, um, these gangs would be in some ways celebrating uh, this bill passing through Parliament. Why, why do you go as far as that? Well, there's considerable evidence that every time that we spend more money on trying to close down one route um, that is being uh, regularly used for uh, smugglers to bring people through irregular means to the UK, or indeed in any other country, this is the case. The evidence shows that those routes, um, the people who are desperate to take those routes don't simply disappear. In fact, the routes are simply redirected often to more dangerous um, paths. So. Um, it doesn't stop the journeys, but it does allow the smugglers to charge more um, for yet more dangerous journeys, yet more complicated um, ways of, of making it through um, these barriers. And there's always going to be more flexibility on the side of the smugglers than on the side of the state. Um, so until we provide people with a real alternative way, a, a regulated means of travel to the UK, um, then every round of security spending that we throw at this and every um, repeated attempt at this failed model of deterrence and pushbacks um, is celebrated by the smugglers because it simply lines their pockets. Um, and in terms of the sentencing, the increased sentencing that is proposed under this bill, that's all very well and would be um, perfectly reasonable if this these were um, aimed in reality at smuggling gangs. But what we've seen in the last 12 months is that the Home Office has used legislation that was intended to be uh, used against smuggling gangs and criminal um, members of international criminal gangs to unjustly prosecute um, asylum seekers themselves. Um, and uh, several asylum seekers have served jail, jail time on the basis that uh, they were facilitating the entry of other asylum seekers on the same boat as them. Um, and this, this practice was being undertaken until the uh, Crown Prosecution Service published in August of this year, um, some clarified guidance that confirms that the legal situation is that it is not a crime to enter the UK if you're even on a small boat or through other irregular means, if your purpose is to present yourself to the authorities and to seek asylum. And given that it, that is the case for all, almost all, if not all, I think the official figure is 98% of the people on these boats. Actually, it's been confirmed that these people are not committing a crime, they're not committing an immigration offense. And the danger of these increased sentences is that they will be targeted at the wrong people um, and that they'll be used to punish people who are exercising their right to claim asylum rather than being targeted at the people that it should be, which is the organized criminal gangs, which should be done on the basis of credible intelligence and international cooperation, and not the basis of picking people up off the beach in Kent, um, where they clearly intend to make an asylum claim. Um, you've said that you think the, the sort of policy of trying to disincentivize people from making these crossings isn't going to work. And on the other hand, some of the, the measures used to try and pursue that uh, disincentive effect, like the notice of intent, will have really pretty awful impacts on those imp uh, affected by them. Um, can you say just a little bit more about some of the other disincentives? So you've mentioned the notice of intent, that obviously there's criminalisation, uh, measures around no recourse to public funds and family reunion. How will that impact on individuals and the local authorities that are involved in trying to support them? Yes, so this refers to the differential treatment for people who, uh, once they have arrived and they've been served with their notice of intent and they've waited the six months in this unnecessary and harmful limbo situation uh, in the asylum system. Um, if the government, as is likely to happen in most cases, uh, does not find somewhere else to send them off to, um, does not find another country willing to take on our responsibilities, for them. They will in fact have their asylum claim assessed um, in the usual system. And given that the nationalities concerned are overwhelmingly nationalities that are largely recognized as refugees in this country. So they are, I've mentioned Afghanistan, but they're also from Iran, Iraq, Sudan, um, and countries like this, which overwhelmingly have a high recognition rate, Syria as well. They will then be recognized as refugees in need of protection from persecution. And what the government then proposes to do with this bill is to offer them only a 
um, temporary protection status that is not the same as uh, the refugee protection status that we've uh, provided them with until now. So this would mean people having an unstable status that would need to be consistently renewed potentially once every 30 months and no guarantee of obtaining permanent settlement. Now this is completely um, harmful to the mental health and integration prospects of refugees. It runs counter to obligations under the UN Refugee Convention which requires that recognized refugees are assisted to naturalize and to integrate. Um, but it also just simply doesn't work from a sort of practical perspective. If we're talking about, you know, again, we have an example of JCWI client. He's a gay man from Iran. Um, he's been granted a temporary protection status for six months due to complicated factors of his case. So that what the Home Office is proposing to do there is to reassess whether this gay man from Iran will be at risk again in six months and again in six months and again in six months. And if that was every 30 months, I'm sure that members of the committee can see the, the lack of logic that is being applied there. People who obtain refugee protection very often, almost always, in fact, need long-term stable protection status. They come from countries where it is very unlikely that it will be safe to remove them again within 30 months. Um, this is providing a huge additional bureaucratic burden on home office, on a home office that is already um, failing to uh, get through its caseload at a reasonable speed um, and, and will, will very seriously hamper the integration prospects of those people. And furthermore, and I think that Lucy Morton did just mention this, but those people may be denied the right to family reunification. Um, that means that um, the largely female or child contingent of refugees who are currently able to get protection through a safe route of family reunion um, would then be denied that protection. That might mean that in desperation to join their loved one who has come to the UK, they may then embark on those dangerous irregular journeys. So this may in fact provoke more irregular journeys and again, enrich the smugglers, empower the smugglers yet more. And uh, finally, um, the proposals also suggest that refugees granted this secondary status of protection would not be granted access to public funds that is, again, aside from being cruel and harmful to refugees, it again follows the same pattern of being illogical and impractical. The reality is that if these refugees are destitute, they will be able to apply to have no recourse to public funds conditions lifted. Um, and given that they will have been waiting for at least six months and then gone into the um, standard asylum procedure, which at the moment takes well over six months in many cases, and during that time not allowed to work, plus be people who are uh, recovering from trauma, the likelihood that they can go straight into a job um, and, and earn straight away is extremely low. So the likelihood that they would then be destitute under those circumstances is extremely high, and this is just adding a huge additional bureaucratic burden where there will be application after application for these no recourse to public funds conditions to be lifted, and in the meantime, the risk that people will fall into destitution. Um, so from, from the perspective of fairness, from the perspective of compassion, um, this plan doesn't work, but from the perspective of actually functioning and having an asylum system and a home office that produces you know, an efficient and, and tolerable um, procedures that work on a, a reasonable time frame, again, it completely fails. And finally, to, to Lucy Morton, I don't know if you want to, first of all, just pick up on um, the issue of the sort of additional work that this will create for the Home Office in terms of having to revisit asylum applications every 30 months, even though someone has been recognised as a refugee and with these applications to, to lift no recourse to public funds conditions and so on. Um, but also, um, if I could ask you to do another subject, uh, which I think is, is about the pushbacks at sea and whether you think this is perhaps a little bit more about headline grabbing than actually worthwhile legislation. Uh, I think my colleague's point on the on the admin and the administrative burden of having to constantly reassess and redecide claims, I think that's absolutely right, and that feeds back into the point I made earlier about resourcing. You can't make this work if you don't put the resources in to do it, and if you want civil servants to reconsider applications every six months, every 30 months, you're going to have to put enough civil servants in there to do it. The issue of uh, pushbacks... As things stand at the moment, the instructions that we work under to ensure the safety of life at sea and the legality of it, it is such that 
it seems uh, to us as, as the trade union, to the members who advise us, uh, extremely unlikely to happen in practice. Uh, the restrictions are quite rightly very, very tight. No one wants to see a fatality from what is an, a, a very dangerous manoeuvre. Um, there was, it was not expected to be announced in the way in which it was. Uh, it had been something actually that had been in discussion uh, in various iterations actually for, for a couple of years. Um, but to be announced suddenly uh, in the press and the way it was came as something of a surprise uh, and had the unfortunate impact of endangering both border officers and migrants uh, because suddenly migrants were at fear that they were going to be pushed back even though they're in circumstances where they never would be. They're vulnerable, the vessel is vulnerable, it's got vulnerable people in it, it's not in the right beat of the channel. Um, but because they are frightened of being approached by border officers, they are less willing to be rescued in circumstances where actually they very deeply need rescue. And that was something that, that was most unfortunate. I will personally be very surprised and recognise the risk in saying so, but if this actually ever happens uh, and is completed, I would be amazed. We don't see migrant vessels that are not vulnerable in one way or another. Thank you. Your last point there before I come to the point that I was going to make. Um, are you saying that the people in the boats would be scared of the border force, etc., because of what's been said? When we listened to the Red Cross earlier, what they were telling us was that the people getting into boats which weren't informed about what was going on or what sort of law was going on. So, how would they have um, a perception that they were, the law had changed and they were going to be pushed back on that when they wouldn't have any perception that as, as to everything else that the Red Cross had said earlier? The communications channels uh, between migrants who make it and migrants that are waiting and also the spin that is put on it by the smuggling gangs uh, is absolutely phenomenal. So, for example, we were seeing a lot of uh, migrants being told that this route, that the small vessel route over the English Channel, would become illegal once the UK had left the EU. It was illegal before, it was going to be illegal after, nothing changed. But the gangs used that to pressure more people into taking the route, go now before they stop it and also to charge more money for that route. Uh, so different vessels have different amounts of information, but this has been reported quite widely in the press. Uh, it is, the migrant groupings uh, in France, I understand, are now aware that this is a risk. Um, and we know that they resist uh, approaches by the French. Uh, they put themselves at risk in order to prevent the French intercepting and returning them whilst they remain within French waters. And we do get reports from our members on the cutters, and um, particularly the smaller ribs, uh, that until they are absolutely sure that that's a British vessel they've got, they're far more likely to trust the RNLI or the Coast Guard, who they recognise because they're on telly and it's a different uniform. Um, they're far more likely to trust them than they are to trust us. And the last thing that we need is somebody standing up and going overboard. Because if they're trying to avoid being intercepted, either by the French or by us or by anyone else that they don't recognise, that is the risk. Okay. It just seems a conflict to me that, you know, on, on the one hand, the witnesses earlier were saying that the migrants didn't have information and now you're saying that they do have information. So I think there's a... a, a, a now, can I just jump in on that point? I think there's a difference between having some sort of um, gossip information or potentially misinformation about what will happen directly on the boat journey and what to do immediately on disembarkation. Um, and actually having a complex and sophisticated understanding of the functioning of the asylum system in the UK, and especially as compared to the functioning of the asylum system, for example, in France. Um, so I think the levels of, of understanding and information, are, as Lucy very rightly said, firstly, there's a lot of misinformation going around, but also knowing that, you know, you need to avoid being um, intercepted at sea is very different to knowing um, these will be your entitlements once you've got to this stage in the uh, asylum system in the UK, so they, they are different issues. I think that's a fair point, it's more about misinformation and spin and misunderstanding than it is about concrete information and a robust or detailed knowledge of actually what happens. No, no, I get that, but I think that's you know, in all aspects in both directions as well. Anyway, I'll come to the point that I was, I was going to come to. One, uh, one of the things that we see is um, you know, the, the, the number of cases and the backlog of cases increasing. Uh, but at a faster rate than the number of applications are increasing. And um, what I'd like to try and understand is whether that is purely resources, as you've indicated there are concerns about resources anyway, but um, as to whether there are things in the bill in terms of the way 
there is, you know, the, the legislation could be written to make it so that it was easier to make decisions and the decisions could be clearer and quicker and swifter rather than have too many complexities in which results in longer times before you get a first decision. Um, is it the, the bill? Is it the resources? Is it a combination thereof? It's a combination inevitably, uh, but there are elements to both. Uh, the rate of cases in decision uh, is increasing in relation to the, the number of initial applications, but that's because of late and repeated applications that slow things up, and that may well be an element in the 399 uh, that was mentioned earlier. Uh, one of the provisions in the bill suggests that uh, individuals be served with a notice of information if you don't produce all the information that you know at that time, you will not be able to bring it up later, or if you do bring it up later, much less weight will be given to it. Um, I'm not convinced that that will actually work as well in practice as it might appear. There will always be information that changes if someone's been here and been in the system for six months or six years. There can be a change of situation in their home country that might make late information come up. Uh, even if the information comes up late and is given less weight, it still, it might have less weight, but it still must be considered and it will still have some limited access to appeal, albeit I think the intention is to remove the ability to judicial review the decision by giving an expedited uh, appeal through the immigration tribunal's process. Um, but if the immigration tribunal's process doesn't have uh, the capacity to hear that case for six months, then it's not going to make a great deal of difference anyway. Uh, but certainly any measures that assist in encouraging uh, migrants to produce as much information as they intend to rely on at the beginning, and most, most do, um, but you get to the end of the system and then suddenly you get, oh, but hang on a minute, now I've changed my religion, recognised my sexuality, the situation at home has changed, now I'm married, now I've got a child, I've got closer ties here, there, or medical, whatever the additional applications that are coming in. Anything that can control and manage that better will help. That is a recognised method of uh, abusing the process, but it, we can't shut it off because there will always be people for whom that is absolutely true, and their situation has changed, and they do need protection, and we need to have a method of being able to consider that quickly, get it through the appeals process quickly if that's relevant, identify those who are abusing the system, and, and crucially remove them, which of course is a, another large part of this bill is the ability to remove the people who come to the end of the system, uh, while still identifying and extending protection to those where we have an obligation to do so. And do you think the bill as written currently helps that process or not? As written, it help. everything's going to be in the detail. The words used will help. Um, but I suspect we will find ourselves in the situation in two or three years' time where there's been a loophole or there's been a contrary decision of an upper court uh, which has changed the way in which this actually works. And there will always be genuine last minute situations. There will always be genuine uh, last changes that merit a fresh application. Whereas if you put the resourcing in, almost front load it, put the resourcing in at the beginning, if you can decide an application in a matter of weeks, if you can have it through the court system in a matter of weeks, the scope for those last minute changes of situation is significantly narrowed. So if you make it make the whole thing faster and tighter, rather than just try and block the tail end of a, a very lengthy process, that would probably be more beneficial, both to genuine refugees uh, and to the British taxpayer. Um, okay, I mean the question is primarily Adley, so I don't know whether Zoe wants to... Uh, Okay. I don't want to limit anybody's questions, only there's quite a few I'll people who, who, who would like to ask questions. So, um, Jonathan Gullis. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm a bit perplexed because on one hand I'm hearing that the system's broken, on another hand I'm hearing that ultimately this isn't going to be good enough, despite the fact that you've, you've said, Lucy, that the pushbacks is something which I think our commanders on those vessels need support and top cover from that that isn't a deterrent, even though you said that people will be scared of it. Um, we've talked about the fact that people won't be getting access to housing in the legislation, Clause 11. We'll put them, use like, things like Napier Barracks, which I think is brilliant, uh, use of public resources there as well. Um, that won't deter. We've talked about the fact that those illegal economic migrants, because they're the ones coming over from the channel at the moment, because Stoke on Trent, they live it, at seeing illegal economic migrants paying thousands of pounds into the hands... I, I don't want to stop you, but 
I just, it would be great if there could be a question. There will be, Mr. McDonough, there will be. A question so that your colleagues can also ask. Absolutely. Them. So, with the thousands of pounds being put into the hands of people smugglers from illegal economic migrants, does that not show us that ultimately these people are not genuine refugee asylum people like we have seen over from Afghanistan we brought through safe and legal routes and through Syria through safe and legal routes? It is a system that requires a great deal of money. And if you you're not likely to have that money immediately available to you if you have fled in circumstances of danger, um, that you may be able to gain it from relatives outside of the country. Uh, worse though, you may put yourself into the hands of uh, people traffickers who will lend you the money for your crossing in exchange for your services uh, in one way or another in the UK, uh, be that in the grey economy or, or within modern slavery. Uh, but if you knew that before you spent all that money, it was only going to get you a few weeks here uh, until your claim was processed and dealt with, then you'd be far less likely to spend that money. If you know that you spend that money and you're going to spend six to ten years here to get through the system, that money's probably worth it. Which is why, for example, legislation, therefore, the idea under Clause 11, I think, or Clause 10, where we're obviously going to potentially process people offshore in our United Kingdom, you know, like we're seeing with Denmark, and the idea, so that's a positive, that will help deter them, of essentially, because if people know they're going to spend all that money and not even end up in the United Kingdom, then that's a positive of this legislation. I think the experience in Australia, um, from what I understand, has been that it hasn't been as deterrent as they would have hoped, but certainly on paper, uh, anything that shortens the system uh, is, is going to be a positive. Whether it will deter the, the reasons why people travel, as Zoe said earlier, are so multifactorial. Um, it's not going to be a 100% answer, but nothing is. If there was an easy answer, we'd have done it a decade ago when this started to be a problem. It, it may help, but it, it won't be a, a universal panacea. Zoe, sorry, quickly. I'll leave okay. it on. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just pick up on the distinction you were making between um, Afghan refugees and um, the people that you refer to as illegal economic migrants crossing the channel. And it um, might interest you to learn that um, Afghans actually make up one of the most significant groups of the people making um, those irregular journeys across the channel. So um, uh, JSWI has some difficulty in ascertaining at what point these people switch from being considered um, refugees, for example, if they worked with our military, for example, if they're gay and fleeing persecution by the Taliban. Um, and and if, if given that the um, resettlement efforts, as laudable as they are, will necessarily not reach all those people, certainly not reach even all the people who've worked with our troops in that country. Um, if those people are facing being hunted down and murdered by the Taliban and, and are forced therefore to make a chaotic and, and immediate escape by whatever means necessary, that being with a smuggler, that does not remove um, their need for, for protection. It does not make them any less refugees. Um, and I think that it's really useful that you make that point because it does point to the wider issue that this bill seeks to do, which is to draw a completely false distinction between two groups that are essentially the same people. Um, as I've mentioned, the uh, people who are in Calais at the moment, who are making that crossing, are, um, I think from the uh, figures, we have over two thirds of them are from countries with very high recognition rates as refugees in this country. So as I said, they're from Iran, they're from Sudan, they're from Syria, they're from Afghanistan. They are refugees and they do need our protection. But um, I think I would, I would draw the committee's attention to the commitment made by the Home Secretary to implement the recommendations of the Windrush Lessons Learned Review. One of the recommendations that Wendy Williams made in her review was to avoid viewing policymaking on a binary of do this or do nothing. And I think that that's the binary that you, um, with respect to putting forward here, um, nobody is suggesting that the status quo is an acceptable situation. Unfortunately, the do this option, um, according to all the available evidence, is likely to make the situation significantly much worse. Um, rather than achieving its ends. As Lucy mentioned, the evidence from Australia suggested that having offshore processing centers for refugees made no discernible impact on the numbers of people attempting the crossing. However, um, it did have a huge impact of cruelty and harm on the refugees who are subject to, to that offshoring. Um, and we already have difficulty in this country ensuring that um, asylum seekers have adequate access to legal representation, to adequate hygiene, um, and, and to their other most basic needs um, while in this country. And, and to take that 
um, process offshore to somewhere out of sight and away from our ability to scrutinize it would make it much more difficult to ensure that those minimum standards were met. Um, as uh, you know, I would hope would never happen is what happened in the Australian case where um, teams of experts from um, the UN, teams of experts from Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, teams of pediatricians uh, reported finding the most traumatized population that they had ever seen and ever worked with, including among victims of torture. There was um, extremely elevated rates of self-harm and suicide, even among children. Um, and it ended in abject failure. Not only, as I say, had it not successfully deterred people from taking boats to Australia, but it also ended up with um, the Australian government forced to medically evacuate all remaining residents of those camps in 2019, um, having spent, I believe, 6 billion euros on the entire process. So an, an absolutely disastrous model for the UK um, that we absolutely should not be pursuing, aside from the um, moral objections that may not be shared by all, but that JCWI certainly feels about one of the richest countries in the world, the UK, attempting to palm off our responsibility to refugees um, onto a, a developing country such as Rwanda. Um, quite aside from that, the impact was cruelty and the cruelty with no point, no purpose, no achievement. Um, the situation just continued. You have put your case continued. extremely well, and I, I don't want to inhibit what you want to say, but I do want to see if mem more members can ask questions. For one then, Chair, which is, if these people in Calais are legitimate refugees, why are they not claiming asylum in France, Italy, Spain or Greece? Why do they need to come to the United Kingdom? Um, as I'm sure you'll be aware, because I think the previous witness did say this, the vast majority of people who seek asylum worldwide, firstly, 86% of refugees and displaced people worldwide remain in the country neighbouring the one they have fled. So 86% of people remain in developing countries. Um, France received three times as many asylum applications as we did last year. Most people stop as soon as they feel safe. But the people who are making their way to the England and who specifically wish to come to the UK do so because they have ties to this country because they either have served with our military as in the case of people from Afghanistan or have family members as with the Syrian client that I mentioned um, that JCWI is representing or speak the language because of our colonial history and have other um, ties of kinship um, and history here. So there are people who have legitimate ties to the UK and there is no good reason why they should particularly have their claims assessed in France if they do not wish to. It doesn't really work for us to say to the French that given that we're geographically located slightly to the west of you, none of these refugees are our responsibility and they're all on you because France can say the same thing and then Italy can say the same thing and then the entire international refugee protection system will crumble. So it is necessary that we Ms. step Gardner, up and you take are making fair the share case really well, but I'm trying to get a couple more people in before we go to the minister, if that's okay. So I apologise. Um, Paul Blomfield. Uh, I'll be brief. Both witnesses have uh, expressed concerns that the bill's objectives um, uh, won't be uh, achieved by the measures that it includes. The Home Office itself goes further in its own impact assessment, saying, quote, that there is a risk that increased security and deterrence could encourage those cohorts to attempt riskier means of entering the UK. I wondered if you could share your views with us on that. First, Lucy. That has been the experience to date. Um, there is a large displaced population within Europe. Um, the majority have been there for some time. Uh, just under half on the last set of statistics I saw have a failed asylum claim elsewhere within Europe. Um, whether they have legitimate ties here, legitimate reasons to be here or not, um, they're, not going to, they're, they're not going to simply say, oh gosh, it got a bit difficult today, let's turn around and go home. If they don't have another route that they can try, they will simply become, as the risk assessment says, more and more risky. So we fortified the, the we built the fence around the edges where Eurotunnel trains were. So they moved to Calais. So we fortified Calais port. So they moved to Boulogne and went further north. We went up to La Havre, went up to Westphiam. Uh, every time you, you build a wall, they just move a little bit further down. Nobody wants, I don't think anybody wants, uh, to build a, a massive fence along the entireties of northern France, Belgium uh, and Holland. But if we did it, they'd come from Spain. Uh, it's not simply reinforcing the border 
does, is not effective if you don't then also provide some form of alternate route, uh, and ideally an expedited route. Well, just if Sonia has anything to add to that. Yeah. Could I? Sorry. Um, I, I, sorry. I, I think she's just... covered it perfectly. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I, I am only trying to get. So um, both to um, Anne um, and to um, Stuart, you've got a cu you've got about a minute to answer your question and get some answers before I bring the minister in. Thank you very much. Um, I actually have a question for Lucy, which she's partly answered, so maybe I'll just check with you offline because I don't have much time, but thank you for partly answering it. Um, and This is for Zoe. Uh, I just want to invite her to... I know that JCWI have concerns about statelessness. She wants to say something about that. But also, we talked about uh, this morning about the bill being at odds with our international obligations. just wondered if you could comment on the fears that the British Red Council expressed this morning. Um, that if we do it, and you've referred to it yourself, there could be a domino effect. If we start saying not on our doorstep, France could say the same. But even more worrying, countries where most people end up, like bordering countries, Afghanistan, where the member opposite for Stoke and Trent North said the genuine refugees come from, we've asked countries to keep their borders open. What if they start saying, no, we'll not keep our borders open. If the UK is not going to do it, then France is not going to do it. And it's that domino effect that's really worrying. And, and finally, Stuart Anderson. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm trying to understand uh, one of the points you made earlier about your example of the young gentleman from Syria came over here and you said that with the legislation, even if he's um, uh, s sent back out of the country, he will try to get back in regardless of what legislation, even though he knows the system. Is that solely because he has family members here or no matter what legislation we put in, people are still, even when they know the system, going to keep trying to come back in? Could you expand on that, please? Well, I, I certainly wouldn't like to say that I know anything about his intentions individually. But I would say that um, as, as a young person and a refugee, um, if he were to be sent to another country, you know, anybody under those circumstances would seek to be with their loved ones. It's the natural and human thing that we would all do. Um, and, and once you've taken, I think as Lucy Morton really clearly explained, you've taken such a long and such a dangerous journey and seen things that, you know, we in this room have certainly never seen um, and, and hope never to there's no prospect of going back, there's no prospect of giving up. So yes, people will try to make the journey back again. It already happens, you know, it, it's factored into the price in some of the smuggling operations that we hear about of people, if you're turned back by the French Coast Guard, then you get one extra shot for free on us or half price, or whatever. Um, people who have made a journey this far and believe that the UK is the place where they will be safe and where their human rights will be respected, um, will seek to come here and we can't make them disappear. So I think that, and this goes to um, Anne's point, really how the only credible response to this is meaningful and good faith international cooperation. We need to um, engage with the French, step up to say that we will take our fair share and, and speak from a position of moral authority then to ask others to do the same. And that means taking in people who have connections to the UK. OK, thank you, uh, Zoe. Can I bring in the Minister um, at this point? Madam Chairman, if I may. Um, just one question um, for Ms Gardner. Um, obviously, one of the real focuses of the work that your organisation does is around welfare. Now, what sort of assessment do you make of um, our proposals around trying to streamline the judicial processes um, to process cases more quickly and, of course, to remove people who have no right to be here more quickly from that, uh, uh, no right to be here um, more quickly. Um, what do you make of that? Well, I'm quite confused that that being the aim of the legislation, that this is actually the legislation that we have in front of us, because the measures that have been put forward in this bill, as far as I can tell, will only serve to exacerbate and complicate the um, repeated legal claims that, it, that are going to be made. For example, the split standard of proof um, that is uh, in, in this bill that, that would apply a different standard of proof to different parts of a person's asylum claim. That is going to be challenged in the courts, it's going to be tested in the courts, it's going to take longer 
Um, obviously, the delays of the six months will, will make the system take longer. On the other side, slapping a priority um, sign onto somebody's deportation order doesn't actually make any difference. Again, as Lucy said, that is a matter for having well-resourced court systems and a fair and efficient system. And this bill just doesn't do anything to achieve any of that. Right. Um, apologies for what I'm about to do. Order, order. I'm afraid that brings to the end.